Welcome to episode nine of Imagine, where we explore the role technology is playing in redefining creative industries. I'm very excited for tonight's conversation around tech and simulation. Apologies for the way I sound. I got a little bit of a throat thing, so, uh, but we're good to go. Um, first of all, going to thank you for showing up. I'm going to jump in and introduce our first speaker and uh, set us on our way. So our first, our first speaker is an artist, designer, writer, and educator working across various creative fields from architecture to, to digital art to experimental software. He is currently an assistant professor of architecture at the University of Kentucky's College of Design, where he teaches courses on visualization and directs the Critical Software Lab. Uh, his work interrogates the emerging socio-technical effects of code, screens, and software um, in culture. He's fascinated by the strange behaviors and aesthetics unique to computing and digital media, an interest that emerged as a kid playing with Flash and other painting software. In 2019, they published a collection of essays on computational computation, art, and design titled Digital Fabrication uh, Designer Stories for a Software-Based Planet. Please help me introduce our first speaker, Gallo. Oh, I mean, usually that goes a lot more higher. Whoa, 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 whoa. Take it <laughs> away, Gallo. Thanks for joining us here today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kako. Um, thanks for having me. Um, let me just share my screen here. Okay. So, um, you know, I think I'm going to keep it a little bit light and casual. I'm, I'm used to giving much longer presentations that are very dry about research and all of that. So I thought that today would be nice to maybe just show artworks and uh, the kinds of um, uh, experiments that I do that are not necessarily related to my architecture practice. Uh, uh, and this is really my my creative side that, that I'm going to be presenting today. And so I called this um, presentation Loops. And um, I'll just take you through a kind of journey uh, through what I've been excited about the, over the past, let's say, three years. Um, you know, I think uh, during the pandemic, I, I had, you know, we all had a lot of time ourselves. Uh, something that I kind of revisited during lockdown was this idea of um, creative coding. Like I, I, I had done a couple of um, different types of creative coding. Sometimes it's animation, sometimes it was a sort of um, simulation or generative design in, in grad school and, and when I was a teenager using Flash. Uh, but for a long time, I didn't really do any kind of creative uh, coding or or even just uh, artistic side projects because I was really focused on on architecture because I'm I'm a trained architect um, and uh, and I teach architecture so it was kind of like architecture all the time and then when the when the pandemic hit I I, I was kind of tired of of that and I started painting um, and I, th I started painting uh, digitally so I started making making digital paintings and I started. Uh, messing around with processing, the, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with processing, and um, you know, and, ju and just this uh, quest to to sort of express myself and to mess around with these um, instruments that I haven't touched in a while. Um, I started to get really obsessed with this idea of a painting that could paint itself forever, a kind of simulation of painting that wasn't necessarily um, skeuomorphic, right? So. Uh, you know, not not a painting that pretends to be sort of made out of physical mixed media or something like that, but rather what is a digital painting supposed to look like or what, what can a digital painting look like and what would a painting that paints itself over and over and over again look like? And so um, I started to experiment with a couple of different themes um, in this uh, purely sort of aesthetic practice. Um, I started to look at this idea of a gesture right, uh, which is fundamental to, to painting, right, the sort of expression of the gesture and the stroke um, on, on the canvas. And I was thinking about what could that feel like or what should that feel like in, in the digital world? You know, does it have to feel like a, an actual brush stroke? Because, you know, Photoshop has all of these tools that try to uh, simulate real brushes, right? They have dry brushes, wet brushes, watercolor brushes, and all of that. And I was wondering, 
what if um, a digital brush is more of just like a sort of chunky pixel type of, um, you know, uh, what if it feels like you're just literally pushing the pixels around in a kind of chunky way, right? Um, I was I was fascinated by early painting software, like, you know, early Microsoft Paint or Mac Paint, or even earlier experiments in, in painting. Um, and I, I really like those sort of low resolution painting apps that that were um, around in the 80s and the 90s because those really uh, expressed the the materiality of the pixel in in very interesting ways. Mostly because they, uh, you know, they didn't have the resolution that we have today, right? So they had to sort of optimize for for very particular um, constraints. And so I, you know, I started thinking about gestures and and I started making these paintings where I would paint and the the software would record the gesture and then play it back like 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second or something like that. And so then I could keep painting on on top of the same canvas um, and produce this sort of automatic painting, right? Um, it's still sort of, you know, hand painted, but the, the gestures themselves become sort of automated be, because they're recorded, right? Um, and I, I started to make these uh, different drawing apps in processing that would um, allow me to have, uh, allow me to record gestures, but also allow me to uh, play with um, some other kind of uh, feedback effects, right? So um, I started to think about not only the gesture, but I started to think about what happens when the pixels are manipulated using the gesture and then they can do something more autonomously, right? Like what if they started to act more um, like liquid in, in, in a weird way, not in a sort of simulation of, of uh, like oil paint or acrylic paint, but what if they just started to just kind of bleed and, and do their own thing, you know, sort of like um, autonomous agents. And so I started to look into, um, you know, classical, algorithms like um, reaction diffusion uh, or um, just a very simple uh, kind of growth algorithms uh, that would be driven by a kind of feedback effect. And so it's kind of like when you point a camera, at, you point a video camera at the screen and you create this kind of feedback effect, uh, this video feedback. I'm doing the same kind of thing here, but with pixels. And so the gesture lays down the initial color and then the pixels sort of take it from there and then they start to do their own thing according to different algorithms. And I thought that this was really, um, really interesting. And I was really excited when when I got these types of effects going because it seemed like the, the gesture that loops and it puts pixels on the screen and then the pixels start to have a life of themselves, but then the painting loops back in on itself. And so it's, it, it looks like water or it looks like, you know, um, sort of natural simulations, but it's all just very simple pixel to pixel, almost like cellular automata type of um, effects, especially um, because I, I was calling attention to the 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 low resolution aesthetic and, and that allowed me to kind of, um, you know, kind of express the sort of materiality of the screen as I, as I as I refer to it sometimes, right? That because our, our screen is made up of discrete pixels, um, and so these uh, the dithering effect um, all of a sudden was not just um, a really interesting way to uh, express the, the the pixel itself, but it ended up being a really interesting way to play with colors as well. Um, and I, I also started to become really obsessed with this idea of um, what is a very lightweight painting, right? And so, you know, in, in the world of high res, where we have an incredible uh, DPI screens, uh, like high density DPI and, um, you know, 20 megapixel cameras on our phones, what would be um, the kind of opposite? What, what's like the smallest megabyte size that a painting, that an animated painting could be and still have really interesting effects? And so, I started to experiment with um, not not necessarily compression, but with just limited color palettes, right? I started to think about, well, what if I just used, you know, pure red, green, uh, blue, yellow, magenta, cyan, um, just that as a color palette. And I incorporated that into the this sort of idea of an animated painting that, that just loops forever. 
Um, and these files ended up being less than one megabyte. And I was really excited about that because, you know, I think um, I, that that really um, was was exciting to make a kind of really compressed painting <laughs> in a way. Like what what's the kind of smallest amount of bytes that you can uh, express yourself with, right? So it was directly um, referencing the the limitations that uh, that people had when they were developing the earliest painting software. Um, and so then I started to take that in in um, more complex directions where I was uh simulating a brush i started to simulate brushes that are that have gradients and some transparency so maybe it's the sort of um started to look a little bit more like the photoshop brushes that that uh, are built in like the kind of dry brush um and then i started to uh, also implement um smearing uh algorithms as well so the the brush itself was not just a you know a way of um putting color onto the canvas, but then the brush could also smear the color in other ways. And still everything was uh, kind of happening on top of uh, some kind of a growth algorithm. So here um, you see sort of reaction diffusion going on in the background. Um, and the trickiest part about the, this particular series of, of paintings that I was making was um, how to get it to loop on in on itself, right? Because reaction diffusion is, is always growing uh, and um, it doesn't really loop back in on itself ever. Um, and so then I, I started to become really obsessed with algorithms that could in some way loop or I, that I could make a seamless loop out of things that maybe don't look like they would naturally loop. Um, and so I started to get really, really into this idea of perfect loops. And I started to look into manipulating time in a, in a way such that the, you would never really perceive a beginning or an end, right? And 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 I thought that that would be a really interesting direction to to explore, um, you know, in terms of like expressing the digital, right? Because the digital is, is feels very infinite in a, in, a, in a weird way, and so making an infinite painting was for me something that. Um, I don't know, it's still kind of the the ultimate goal is, is to make a kind of infinite painting. Um, and and I think the, the the work sort of started to evolve and uh, I, I started to get a little bit of a following on, on social media. And um, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to exhibit these, uh, some of these artworks in um, in London uh, and uh, at, at some other venues um, at uh, in New York as well. Um, this is is uh, probably one of the most sophisticated kind of algorithms that I, I, I got to come up with, which is, uh, I call it silica. And in this series, what you're seeing are a series of automated gestures that very, very lightly um, start to um, put different colors on the canvas um, as a very, very subtle, like very low transparency gradient. Uh, but because of the feedback that that is going on in the background, the colors get saturated slowly over time, and they achieve a kind of equilibrium. And so there's a sort of um, saturation that that happens uh, where all the colors are at their maximum saturation, um, and then they just keep moving, right? And so then the colors just keep shifting because the brush always uh, repeats itself, like in the previous studies. And so the brush is always repeating itself and it's layering the same colors, but the, the colors are, they can't get any more saturated. And so they just kind of ebb and flow. Um, and this was um, the sort of liquidity that I was I was kind of aiming at in, in the very beginning was something that's super smooth, but doesn't really look like, you know, normal liquid or or it doesn't look like paint. It just looks like something else. And, and that something else for me is, is a sort of fundamentally kind of digital. Um, because it, it just has to do with the way that these colors are um, um, almost like uh, interacting among themselves from a pixel to pixel level. Um, and then I started to play around with different resolutions and, and I started to think about, well, if I'm if I'm already sort of dithering and, and quantizing these colors, what would the movement look like at different resolutions? And so you, you see um, some experiments here where I was uh, making the pixels really, really chunky so that you could really feel it and um, and still contrasting that chunkiness with a sort of fluid movement. Um, and these are all, uh, you know, 
subtle evolutions of, of each other. This is also done in processing. And here I'm, I'm really, um, uh, I, I've, I've, I've sort of leveled up in a way, <laughs> if I can say that, uh, and, and I'm um, using four dimensional noise to to loop um, the, the the kind of feedback uh, in, in a really interesting way. And so I like, I ha you had to use the fourth dimension in order to get that, that seamless loop. Um, and uh, luckily, there's a lot of really interesting creative co coders and mathematicians that have figured all of that stuff out. And uh, you know, it's it's really just up to uh, creatives to to um, look at that math and, and make sense of it and, and use it in in this way. And so for me, when I when I sort of discovered this idea of like using the fourth dimension to loop, uh, something kind of clicked, and it was like that's that's what I was looking for, right? I was looking for um, some way of achieving a kind of fluid stochastic effect that. Um, is endless, right, and infinite. Um, and so the the, the, the previous two experiments, um, the the silica and, and strata, they they started to give way to a, another project, which is um, raster. And this one was released um, with um, the Art Blocks uh, NFT platform, which is a kind of high end um, art digital art platform based in Marfa, Texas. And um, it's a it's a process where you you have to apply and, and you go through a curation board and there's a lot of steps and so it took a while for this uh, to go through but they they liked what they saw and uh, and so this project was uh, um, was released as part of their uh, curated collection in in 2022 September um, so basically a year and a bit ago um, and this for me was a kind of watershed moment because these these paintings. Um, where very much a kind of culmination of, of all of the previous studies on gestures, looping, um, you know, the feedback effects uh, and uh, sort of noise uh, algorithms as well. And what this project was really trying to push is this uh, the kind of variation, right? And so um, being a, a sort of long form generative art project, this really looked at what are the different uh, parameters that can yield uh, a whole variety of, um, of compositions, right? And so you've got some more restrained compositions like the one on the left, and then you've got a sort of really wild one uh, on the right. And just changing the the the, the parameters um, allows you to have the same exact algorithm produce all of this different variety. And I thought that that was really, really exciting. And so all of these are generated um, Stochastically, using it just a, a random number seed, um, or sometimes a kind of blockchain seed, so a kind of hash value from from a blockchain transaction um, seeds this these arts these are artworks. Um, and so instead of painting them by hand like uh, like I was doing previously, now these are all truly autonomous artworks that all I have to do is hit play uh, on in processing or um, or just um, you know run a javascript uh, file and then they'll just they'll just run and then they'll generate themselves and so now the process is really about curating the the parameters and and uh looking at the the variety that the algorithm can produce and so these are some other other works where i'm, I'm sort of you know maybe looking at other um other types of gestures or other ways of, of producing a gesture. So the, these are gestures that are produced uh, using a physics engine. And so I programmed uh, a two dimensional physics engine that then um, had a, a kind of spring effect. And, and so the a bunch of gesture, a bunch of like uh, brushes get spawned on the screen um, and then they uh, repel each other. And so they this is the kind of path, the trail that they leave behind are these um, smeared pixels. Um, and so again, I'm still, you know, trying to express the the pixel itself as as a kind of core material, but I'm I'm using now physics and simulated uh, dynamics to um, push those pixels around in in interesting ways. And that sort of um, led to another series of of, of studies. Um, this time, looking at other ways of quantizing and and uh, dithering, um, so other ways of sort of limiting the the color palettes or, or limiting or using limited colors and, and forms to express, um, you know, shade, uh, value, et cetera. And so here, um, these are kind of ASCII artwork uh, algorithms where I'm still using sort of similar 
um, feedback effects and, uh, and and gestures, but the the colors themselves are now being translated into uh, ASCII characters or um, ASCII symbols and, and bitmap symbols. And so here um, now the the feeling is is a little bit more um, I don't know it feels a little bit more technical. There's like a there's almost like a, a kind of sci-fi aspect to these because of the different glyphs that that move up and down. It feels like the Matrix or something. Um, and this was a, a really interesting project. And I um, uh, I I started to offer prints of of this particular project. I, I started printing some artworks uh, as well during this time. But these were um, these were printed on a really cheap inkjet printer on uh, on recycled paper. And I I actually really liked how they came out because the the cheap print sort of reminded you of like uh, printing on your mom's inkjet printer in high school or something. And so um, I, I gave uh, people that collected these, uh, I, I mailed them a print uh, of their edition and, and people seem to really like it. Um, and so that, that kind of um, exploration of, of the kind of movement of the individual pixel then started to um, inspire these uh, other artworks where I'm, I'm looking at the patterns that that um, pixels that individual pixels could create. Um, and so now it's it's less about the dithering, but now the dithering actually um, gives way to almost like different patterns uh, and that can be synchronized in different ways. And so here I've, I've sort of abandoned the gesture in, in a way and I'm not even interested in the gesture. I'm just looking at the transition from color to color, from pixel to pixel and trying to curate uh, very specific movements uh, that are almost like um, reminiscent of punch cards and uh, you know, sort of like uh, visualizations of, um, of on and off switches and lights, like uh, the kind of control boards in 70s sci-fi movies or something like that. And so this is, for me, this is the kind of aesthetic of computation that, uh, that we've seen in, in the media and that we are kind of familiar with. Uh, and so then I started to kind of mix a lot of different things together. This is the first work that I started to do, work in in 3D, where um, I create a 3D scene, and then the image of that 3D scene or the texture on of, of that 3D scene is um, moving um, according to uh, basically a, a sort of animated uh, color cycling algorithm, and then the um, the image itself is also quantized in in a very uh, specific way. Uh, to create this kind of um, regular, like hyper regular dithering, that's almost like um, uh, like stippling, right? It's it's a it's a different type of uh, dithering than uh, the ordered matrix dithering or or something like that. Um, and this uh, this is the last artwork that that I'll show. This is my latest um, series that I published in uh, I think a month about a month ago. Um, this was a set of 50 animated GIF artworks. Uh, they're a little bit higher resolution than than the previous ones, and so I'm, I'm now working at a at a higher resolution just to see what that's like. Um, but I'm also exploring things like form, and I'm I'm looking at um, how noise uh, algorithms can start to produce uh, forms that are sort of strange and, and and not recognizable right because i think some of us that have been in um in the field of sort of computational design we know what noise looks like right we sort of see, we can sort of see the noise pattern sometimes and it becomes a, a kind of trope and i'm trying to uh sort of break that noise um pattern and and, and try to create something kind of sculptural out of it in in, in some way but still two-dimensional and so this is a sort of study of like relief um, gifts, right? So they're like bat, like bas relief, um, almost like etchings or carvings. But they're all that's all just produced um, with a set of uh, very particular algorithms that give you a kind of uh, embossing and uh, 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 yeah, like a deboss and emboss effect. And then um, I'm using uh, the same sort of feedback algorithm to get this to loop back in on itself. And, and so this is only 30 frames, but again, it's really hard to figure out where, where it starts and where it ends. And so um, I'm really excited to just like generate a bunch of these and then just, you know, go through them and, and find ones that I like. And so for me now, it's, it's really just a process of um, playing with the algorithm so that then I can just 
generate a million of these different artworks and and see what uh what comes out or what what's you know what i find interesting um and so i just wanted to end uh i don't know if i'm if i'm on time or not but i just wanted to show like an example of what this looks like so i just have my processing here um and um if i just hit play for example this is the this is a new algorithm that uh, i've been playing with so this is like I'm debuting this uh, in public for the first time, <laughs> um, but this is something I call basalt, and um, this is the the algorithm. This is what it what it generates, and I still haven't really figured this one out completely. But I thought I would share it just to, because I'm really excited about where this is right now. And that's it. Thanks. It's fantastic to see Gala. Super cool. Uh, excited to to jump into it in the conversation. Um, to make as much space for that, I'm just going to jump into introducing our next speaker. Um, so thank you, Gallo. Um, our next speaker works at the intersection of digital culture, visual communication, and architecture. Crossing disciplinary boundaries, he employs cutting-edge technologies to investigate subjects of authorship, perception, and representation. For the past decade, they have been working on architectural scale art installations and immersive interactive experiences that look to use technology to offer visitors a peek into alternative realities blurring between digital and real. He is currently the art director at Sphere Studios in Burbank, creating work that is making MSG Sphere in Las Vegas a global icon and a landmark venue in the 21st century. Please help me welcome Rahman Mustafa. Ooh. Hey, thank you so much, Kaka. Um, really cool to see your stuff, Kalo. It's like uh, really interesting that um, Kaka paired us up because, let me share my screen, we both have a painting background. And we do both, weirdly, have a link to Casey Reyes and processing, which was the person that plucked me out of architecture and brought me back into the art world. So thank you, Casey. <laughs> thank you uh, also, Guvenj, who was on our architecture side that got me and Rafiq to start working together back in 2000. And I don't know when it was, like 20 years ago now. Um, let me share my screen. So yeah, that was really cool to see. Um, um so yeah, I mean, like when Kaku mentioned that this was mostly about simulation, I wanted to really reach back and like understand for myself, really, like as a as a kind of like a my own like you know thinking to myself like why did I how did I end up here? And I think for me, like it was really simulations gave me a way to like explore this mirage of reality, and it's really interesting hearing Gallo talk about his interest in kind of like resolution and de-resing and gestures uh for me it was like really much less scientific and it was mostly about memories and up memories or changing memories and like things that i saw or places that i saw or so i ended up painting those things and so the paintings were really not accurate so like they were not realistic paintings, you know? So for me, the idea of vision and simulating vision was more about vision of feeling rather than vision of what reality was like or could be like, or extending the human ability to experience time or experience memories in a way that may not be possible, like with a pen and pencil or with um, oil paintings or something like that. So I'll show you guys some of the stuff that I've been working on in my lab and some of my uh, original stuff that explores some of those things like memories, vision, um, and I'll also kind of show you um, some of my professional stuff that I've been working on with Rafiq and at Sphere about simulating art, simulating architecture, and simulating humans or extending humans, and uh, now simulating the city or I guess simulating culture. I don't know how. So um, some of my original paintings were much more like abstract expressionist and they were mostly about places and things that like 
were sort of like, I was like, you know, I was feeling that I was being simulated as the thing that I was seeing, I was recording and then regurgitating in my mind in a way that it sometimes is not possible. So I was reaching out to this other dimension to add like this feeling. It was not like accurate in terms of like the feeling of the temperature of the air or like the quantizing the wind patterns or anything like that. It was much more about like the feeling of um, being in that space and feeling that as a memory and replaying that memory in my head really became kind of, it's really interesting that you're talking about looping. It was like, how do I create this infinite painting? How do I loop this memory back over and over so that I don't augment it? And so I ended up at this sort of like Zen, not really flashy like moment where like the things were moving, but they weren't moving so much that I couldn't re I couldn't recover the feeling of my memory's vision. The actual memory vision, but it was like the thing that I really cared about. And that was what I was trying to capture is like really just getting a feeling for that feeling and having a vision of that feeling. Um, and so like I started like, you know, being in as, as well as you guys, we were all architecture uh, architects and architecture majors back in our previous lives, you know, like I started thinking in 3D, like what would this feel like in 3D? So I did this series um, called Home that was like inspired by these uh, quotes from Kurdish immigrants where, you know, like I, I was a Kurdish immigrant at one point and when I came into Western culture and Western architecture, it was much more, it was, it was super strange. So the quote goes something like, I can't go home anymore but I must go to a strange place. The trees, the walls, the birds, everything is strange to me. I have no home. The house is so strange. It's like a sculpture. Um, and so to me, that feeling evoked this, now the memory of home, the memory of like this place that you used to see things or that used to protect you from the weather, used to protect you from strangers or the outside forces and down to like this, like the kind of like the resolution. So I'm like, going the opposite way of, of Gallo, who's like de and bumming code constantly to make the thing more and more efficient. I was maximizing like, what would this door handle feel like from that moment of every touch, from the moment of every opening and every closing and like all these moments that you can't really recover, you can't see in the metal, in the object itself is much more ephemeral and trying to give that ephemeral quality or that memory of that ephemeral quality a form or body. Um, and so like that was really like my interest in how simulation and all those things kind of ended up go going the way that they did and how things, how, how I ended up exploring architecture or in the way that I'm doing now is like really about this experience of having these memories and having these ideas that you're constantly having every day going about your life and imprinting those things in an object and giving it kind of like a form. Um, so we were, we began like one of the last things that we started doing like towards the, um, last year, I think it was, was simulating art. So we took all of uh, MoMA's database. This ended up being like the first NFT that MoMA has acquired and generating a series of artworks that basically take all the artwork that is in MoMA's database and it simulates new futures. It simulates new versions of these artworks, new versions of kind of like combinations of them and reimagining these kinds of things that are like imprinted in human memories and human culture. And what does that mean when this new thing is created? What kind of experience do people have? And I think it's been like a super strange reality now seeing the thing that's reimagining the things that are at MoMA at MoMA like it's super meta and super 2023 but that was a really interesting um, project to turn the mirror of art back on itself and see what it sees what the how how the machine will see what it sees um, and stimulating architecture is something that I think Ramon, we've all sorry all to heard. cut you off Sorry, Ramon, I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but are you sharing the deck as you're going through it? Because we haven't seen the uh, presentation move, and I just want to make sure that we're seeing your slides. Oh, yeah. I It says sharing. Interesting. Is that just me, Gala? Are you seeing the slides change, or are you just seeing? 
I see all the slides, where, but they're not changing. Where, where is it just on the first slide? Yeah, it's been it's been on the first slide. I thought you were doing like a really beautiful intro about oh, your see. stuff, and I didn't want to cut you off, but. Um, <clears throat> Let me see. Maybe I'll just work off here. Um, I think I was talking about MoMA. Yeah, you were talking about MoMA taking the uh, large data set that they had and like they've recently purchased, they purchased like their first NFT. Um, your yep. uh, yeah, whole yeah, experience yeah. around like art I think and memory. On, I, was stuck on the, I was stuck on the first slide, yeah. You're stuck on the in, the the cover page, correct? Yep. Okay. Um. So yeah, I mean, this is. Uh, I'll just briefly go back over. This was the painting that I was mentioning. That was sort of like the starting point. Uh, this is kind of like that extension where I was trying to talk about like sort of looping and creating that like loopable um, infinite moment, like giving the feeling of the painting, the expression of the time and the memory. Um, sort of its like um, its form. This was the home um, project that I was uh, sharing with you. The idea that the home having all these objects, these things that we're used to day to day, um, having all these memories embedded in them. Um, some of the details from that piece, uh, the moment piece, and. Yeah, and I was going on to simulating architecture. Um, this was a really interesting project we did with um, Patrick Schumacher. Uh, was basically um, an installation at the EDP in uh, Seoul, where of space where you could go and view like um, a hallucination or a dream of all of Zaha's unimagined artworks or unimagined buildings in a way that like was like sort of like not realistic and it was like not possible so it, we took this model and we trained it and simulated it on all of Zaha's sketches renderings um and basically gave it this the space to where you could go in and um view this these visualizations occupy all the way around you um, with the sound that was generated also from the pictures. Um, so that was like super kind of uh, strange feeling to see all of these buildings and how Zaha-esque they looked um, not be made by Zaha. So I think that was um, an interesting experience. I think the next thing was um, simulating the human form and kind of expressing and extending how uh, people um, are expressed in space and basically like tracking their environment, tracking their movement, tracking their dance movements and these kinds of uh, gestures would translate into um, kind of like color that rippled through the space. You know, if a, if a dancer were to make a really large gesture, the ripples would be larger and the colors would change, um, you know, like at a more vibrant rate. So it was like sort of this, uh, this experience of like visualizing the intent of the gesture um, much more. Uh, it became like, you know, you, you, you hear sound, but you don't see sound. You see gestures, but you don't you don't see the gestures experience ripple through time or ripple through uh, the fourth dimension in the space that it occupies and this gave that uh, performer um, a way to do that. My favorite piece um, uh, up to date working with the peak was simulating history. It was like basically kind of simulating um, a library and we took the data from uh, this archive. I think it was like. 1. Point, yeah, 1.7 million documents and we made this in immersive space uh, that was projection map with uh, with a touchpad and you could go in there and query the system um, any information that it had in it and it would pull that information up or you could go search images 
So it was like kind of this idea of like simulating a library, like basically this thing that once was like one of the largest buildings on a campus could now be compressed into this uh, simulated space where you could go and actually query this library and find it's like command F for a library rather than having to go and search the library, search the book, search the page. So I thought that was like a really interesting um, take on how you how, how you apply this idea of simulation. Um, now we're kind of simulating the city. Uh, I guess you could say the sphere is urban scale simulation. Um, and it's a it exists as a digital twin, so we're, we have an urban simulation, but it's a simulation that takes all of the other pieces that I've talked about, like memory, like art, um, like space or gestures, and it gives it like an urban scale. Really strange. Um, the video won't play, so you'll have to go check it out on the Sphere website. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that, and we'll we'll leave some time to chat about um, this stuff together. Thanks for that, Ramon. I had no idea that both of y'all were secret painters, but maybe I just got uh, maybe I just got a um, nope. Oh, sorry, it looks like Mon accidentally left the room. Hey. What's up, Armand? Thank you for that presentation. Uh, I had no idea that y'all were both secret secret painters, but I guess y'all just have that vibe. Um, and this is the part where I was like, I want to open it up to both of you. You've seen each other's work. Um, now, like, if you have questions about each other's work, process, uh, like, really, like, what, really, like, this is meant to be a, just like, the moment for a conversation, so. And I can uh, ask. A bunch of questions, but my throat is feeling a little funny, so I'm gonna let y'all. My number one question is: You started with one megabyte. What are the file sizes now? Um, it depends. They're they're not that big. I mean, I'm looking at the some of the test gifs from um from the processing script that I just showed you, and they're like 1.5 megs, uh, one two two point six megabytes <laughs> i'm still That's i'm awesome. still like working under under 10 megabytes like actually you know what ends up being part of the constraint is um the file size of a gif that you can upload to twitter or x i guess Got yeah it. yeah so if i can share it on social media it's it's good that's awesome i like that as a uh, it's like a character friendly artwork kind of thing but it's interesting because it's gotten so complex um, that you're still able to, like you're, you're saying you're working at a higher resolution now. What's the resolution that you're working at? Uh, so the high resolution ones that I showed were, I mean, it's not even that high. It's, I think it's like 1200 by 900. So still around HD, <laughs> not, not, not even at 4K yet. Um, and I think that's mostly because GIF is a, that is my sort of medium of choice, and it's a uh, somewhat of a raw format, so you can't have like too many frames with too many pixels, essentially. Yeah, I mean, you have two hundred and fifty six colors, right? Are you do you find having the that limitation as like a, a a good barrier to work against, or is it like you're ready to break out of the two fifty six? No, I like it. Uh, so something else about me that, that's kind of funny is that I'm colorblind or partially colorblind. So I'm, I'm red, green, colorblind. I have a red, green deficiency, I guess. Um, and so I can't I can't see too many uh, like subtle colors. So for me, uh, things like the, the P3 color gamut, for, for instance, that was released for Chrome. Everybody was very excited about that recently, but I can't see the difference between the like the new higher gamut and and the 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 original ones. So the I'm I'm okay with 256 colors really personally, um, but I also like the sort of exercise of of limiting yourself to like eight and then, you know, sort of imagining what that was like back in in the 1970s or something where you literally could only process eight colors and that's it. <laughs> right. 
I mean, you, you're cool. dealing with um, with huge data sets. Like, how? What kind of infrastructure do you need for for all of that? Um, so there's like a couple of DGXs that run the MoMA piece. Um, so like super super HPCs that run the pieces, um, or any kind of research um, in like. Most of the cases, like the databases are what's the, like most most databases require so much operation, like cleaning and sorting and tagging. It's like just that alone is like, it's kind of interesting hearing you talk about like, you know, how you, how you, your approach is like, you're, you're looking at very specific things like pixel to pixel um, transformations or animations or like, they're very like kind of technical um explorations and that's kind of like what we're trying to get the ai to do so that we can get the picture to do something else it's really interesting that like it's almost like what you're saying about you're creating you're like doing the punch card the punch card way in a way that like is a, you know like you're much more interested in like de-resing whereas the ai is more interested in up resing or like regenerating i guess and that takes like a crazy amount of um, computational power mm -hmm. yeah. but in my own stuff i'm like just you know i'm i'm doing like normal stuff like in processing or in um, cinema 4d um and uh i use a lot of like the uh, more local friendly tools like um you know, stable diffusion based tools or anything like that that runs on like just local HPCs, but that doesn't really take a DGX, but mm -hmm. it's still nice to have the gas when you need to press it, right? Yeah. What's, um, I'm, I'm curious about the sphere, like that your work, like I'm, I'm fascinated by sphere screens. I actually wrote a paper about spheres a couple of years ago because I was fascinated with like the history of like bubbles and, and all this kind of stuff. And so when the sphere was built, I was like, oh my God, I have to go there. And I'm actually going there in, in December. Um, so oh, I'm pretty nice. excited to, to check it out. So I was kind of obsessed with the sphere. And <laughs> I'm, it, I'm is, wondering, like, it is like the most hardcore 3D problem yeah. I could have ever imagined. It's like making things for that thing is like a whole new um, animal. But you're going to ask something, sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask, like, what's the sphere screen like? Like, how do you map it? And, you know, do, is it unfolded? Is it unrolled? To, <laughs> is that how you sort of design for it? Or do you design fully yeah. in 3D? You, you design fully in 3D with the idea that you will have to, it's kind of, sort of like the, you know, Instagram 360 cam type of thing where like you have to imagine that you'll have to see this like left and right is not left and right, but it's like the same place loop back around. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to like sort of imagine geometrically, it's kind of like you see maps of the, of the earth all the time and you never really kind of calculate um, the shapes of things like, you know, like the whole thing about Antarctica being really huge and these mm -hmm. kinds of things. So like, in the scene, things will look really whack, but it will roll back onto the sphere correctly. But yeah, it's like a really interesting 3D problem. Um, and I'm working with like a lot of um, artists. I don't know if I can if I can say, but uh, to to create stuff for a sphere. And it's really interesting how some people that have worked in VR are so much easier to pick up that inside out thinking than people that have been working on like traditional flat screens. Right, because you're used to like spherical maps and, and all of that. Funny that I say traditional next to screen now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's exciting. But it's uh, it's it's still a, a like what is it a 4K resolution or? Right, it's a little bit more than 4K. Yep. Inside inside is 16K. Outside is a little bit more than uh, it's a little bit under 5K. Yep. Yeah. That's a lot of K. <laughs> A lot of pixels. That's yeah, like uh, uh, more than uh, over a million uh, individual diffused bulbs. Um, it takes like an, we have an entire team just maintenance just if bulbs go down because it's a diffused bulb. Basically, each LED puck is 
you know, diffused by like a array of LEDs to create an illusion of brightness, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, the the things that are spherical, like emoji, have done so well <laughs> because everybody wants to see. So that's what's interesting about like sort of simulating this thing that is urban scale, but now when you put an emoji on it, now you have an urban scale emoji. Now how do people react seeing this thing that they're used to seeing on their screen be this big? sort of like the emoji movie like landing on their in their city. It's like really interesting like the um people's reaction like of how this augment this thing is augmenting reality like in a re- very real way. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um. I want to make sure that we have some space to answer some questions from the audience. So I'm going to ask uh ask one of them real quick this one's from maya flores uh you've discussed going back i I think this question applies to both of y'all because you you both of y'all um i have met you through like architecture like in in school uh had no idea that you were both secret painters and then you had like have also like branched off doing um like ex- exploring digital like making uh in your own ways um so my question is you have discussed going back to painting what pulled you to architecture in the first place well um for me it, it was uh i i wanted to study film actually like I, I i applied to be a film major um in college and uh then I got, I, I think I got cold feet after I realized that like a lot of people that study film don't actually ever get to make films. <laughs> and so then I was like, oh, well, what's a little bit more reasonable architecture? And so I just kind of guessed and uh, and I got into it and <laughs> I didn't know what it was like, what it was supposed to be like, but then I got hooked and it was really interesting. And then I just kept going and I'm still doing it. I'm still teaching it. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was like much more both of my parents will, were civil engineers so i know i knew i did not want to i did not have the math to do that so i was like i can kind of combine art and architecture to do something that's similar to what i wanted to do but the further i went down architecture i think i was more interested in solving um like spatial issues spatial problems like how scale and psychology work or how color theory and psychology and feeling and like these things that I was trying to recover probably from my memories and I just started doing you know like we had some there's um going esque towards the point where I really wanted to work with artists and that's where uh my professor uh, Gudanch and Casey from the art program started this class at UCLA and from there we just kept working I kept working on art projects and you know like found my way back to sort of like what I had originally wanted to do sort of you know in a really loop loopy around way um and just being kind of like more exploratory and not being so baked with like architecture is this thing or am I doing this thing because I want to express these things or solve these problems. I, I guess I guess art has found you both. <laughs> yeah, so that's the next step. Kind of hard. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's like you started in painting and then you went to architecture and then now y'all it's, are it's doing technology. art. It's technology. It's interesting. Um, y'all are both like smart guys exploring yeah. interesting stuff. Uh, so there's another question from the audience. So this one's coming from Eric. Uh, how has art changed when it comes to AI nowadays? That's for me. Because um, I know that Kala, you were mentioning some a- using some agents in in your pieces, and Ramon, I'm curious what you think about this as well. Um, I have I have like a theory of like. Um, like the calculator just helped us solve more equations kind of thing. Like the AI is like helping us create more ideas. I think 
thinking of it like that has been productive for me. Do you know what I mean? Like I can't yeah. really go into a um I, I I'm going to doom 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 loop, but like I think for me is like the way that I the way that I sketch with it or the way that I use it to do certain things is um to enable it's like a human extension thing. It's like to enable that or to enable recover add resolution to an image that represents a memory. So like ex you know like just expanding on some of those things that I can then feed into other processes that I could then explore in other ways. So that's that's kind of my take on it. I think it's going to be like you know there's a million artists at the art fair and there's like a handful at the museum. That doesn't mean the people at the art fair are not making good art, but there's just a lot of art out there already. It's just, you're not really aware of it because maybe they're not online or something, right? So I think this is just an extension of human creativity and extension of all creativity. And it's going to be kind of interesting to see how it plays out in the next couple of years. I like it when, um, when AI makes weird stuff like I, I i'm not too into the sort of ai that generates very realistic things uh i that's why i was a really big fan of super early kind of style transfer um yeah. you know text to image kind of stuff because it was it was just not accurate at all and it was weird like it was producing some crazy stuff especially and casey uh, reese actually had some really interesting video projects that he made using those early um machine learning uh models and I don't know I, I I I think I'm still trying to figure out how the latest AI can produce weirder stuff um that's that's where my interests lie and uh I don't personally use uh any and yeah any anything like that I've done some experiments with runway when it when it first came out runway was really really exciting because it was it was like the beta was free and it, they had like all these different um free um models and credits that you could use. Now it's like a subscription, right? Um, because they have to make money, but it was fun to play with some of those toys for a while, um, but I haven't really gotten too far into it. I mean, my autonomous agents, they're like just cellular automata. Like it's not, it's not anything super advanced and complex, you know, pretty classical algorithms. I think regardless of 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 like whether AI will do this or that. The thing that's interesting is that, and how we've sort of both ended up here is like, we see a tool and then we see like, how can I mess with this tool that will generate something that I think is interesting? I think that's art. I could be architecture, that could be like really anything. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the product itself, it could be like a bottle, like a perfume bottle or whatever. But like, if it's a thing that you're trying to use the, tool to I'm, I'm constantly trying to break tools you know what i mean like it's like how can i make this do something that is not meant to do and is that interesting and if it's interesting it's then what's interesting about it like, like and to me like that's that was those personal interests like I, the the root of it is like always like is it making me feel something or do i have a memory about something that deals with this so it's like really injecting the human into the the system and like seeing what what you get out of that that's interesting yeah, because at the end of the day, it's it like like you said, Raman, it's a it's a tool, and you're trying to do something, and it's like it's the thing you're using to do the thing. It's not the thing at at the end. It's like you can you can generate images using these these image generation um, AI, but like you're not just taking the image as it gives it to you. You're gonna do something with it. You're gonna like mess it up or like cut it out or some print it or you know, just run it over with some stuff. Um, like, you know, just take it like as is. Like, for example, like something that Galo said was like, I'm going to generate a bunch of these and see which ones I like, right? That in itself is what's really interesting about being human is having preference, right? So you can generate a bunch of those things and the ones that you like, are saying something about your interests or who you are or your views or your memories or whatever it is, right? So like just by the virtue of that, you've taken it out of like the realm of like this thing was presented to me 
and I like it, but like you're now using it as a tool to, of self-reflection, which is what art is, right? It's like this way to, this object through which you can have a conversation, we can have a conversation about like childhood or like conversation about like sustainability, whatever the interests are, right? Like it's a way to get the conversation about certain things of how, what you see in the object. And if that is a tool that helps you get through that, right? Is like, you know, that's interesting. All right, my dudes, it's that time of the night. It's eight o'clock. Um, so I got to say, thank, thanks again for, for joining us on this hour. It's a pleasure to have you both speaking about, uh, speaking about your, your work and your process, uh, always insightful. Um, so thanks for joining us and everybody watching have a right now and in the future, have a good, uh, good rest of your day. Um, so that's it for episode nine of uh, of Imagine, and we'll see. This is this is like the inaugural last last lecture. So thanks for being here. Next week we'll have a workshop. So um, stay posted for links and like sign ups for that. So see you later. Bye bye. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks. All right.